In this section, we're going to discuss how supply and demand interact to give us equilibrium. Equilibrium being the natural state that prices and quantities are going to tend toward. Equilibrium um, is defined as being a state of affairs in which there is no natural tendency for anything to change. Now, I would note here this is a very general definition. It covers not just economics, but also things like um, biological systems or systems in chemistry or physics all really adopt this type of definition. Now in a market, um, equilibrium would be a price and a quantity pair, that is it's a state of affairs, price and quantity, um, where quantity supplied is equal to quantity demanded at that particular price. We would also call this the market clearing price and quantity for reasons that I hope will become clear later on. Now in terms of just identifying it, um, on a graph it's relatively easy. Just take the supply and the demand, find where they intersect, that gives us equilibrium. In the case that we were working with before, um, the price is $10, the quantity is 200. At a price of $10, we know that 200 will be supplied, 200 will be demanded, that is quantity supplied is equal to quantity demanded. And so on the graph, it's very easy to identify. Though we could also do this, say, on a table with the supply and demand schedules. Just look for the quantity supplied and quantity demanded. Line up at the same price. Now let's prove that this actually is an equilibrium, that is, there will be a tendency for stability in this case. Now, in order to prove this, um, we're going to look at three cases, two of which are not equilibrium. That is, where either the quantity supplied is greater than quantity demanded or less than the quantity demanded. The third case will be the state of equilibrium, which I think we'll have a better understanding of once we look at the other two cases. So case one, so there's a price where quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded. Now, this is going to happen when the price is very high. After all, we know if at a very high price, sellers are going to be very willing to supply a lot of the good. The law of, demand, the law of supply tells us that. Um, after all, it's very profitable to provide a good if the price is very high. However, on the other hand, if the price is very high, buyers aren't willing to buy very much of the good. So this creates a situation in which it's certainly plausible that the quantity supplied may exceed the quantity demanded. So let's suppose that it does. The price is that high. The result, then, is what we call excess supply. That is, the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded. That is, sell sellers really want to provide the good to the market, but nobody really wants to buy it at that particular price. This is an excess of supply. That creates frustration for the sellers. Sellers, after all, really do want to sell their product, but they're finding that they're unable to. Uh, people are just not willing to buy the product uh, at that particular price. This creates a very natural incentive for sellers to start cutting prices. After all, if I want to make sure people buy from me, all I really have to do is undercut my competitors, offer at a slightly lower price than they do, and I end up with buyers and can actually sell my product. Um, this is going to be a, a very natural process. It's going to continue as long as the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded. Because as long as that's true, we're offering more for sale than people want to buy. So there will still be frustrated sellers out there, There's still a reason to cut prices. Now this proves that if prices are above equilibrium, then they're going to tend to fall which suggests that these prices are not equilibrium prices. There's a natural tendency for them to change. Case two is just the opposite. Here, the price is such the quantity supplied is less than the quantity demanded. We know this would happen if the price is very low. If the price is very low, sellers don't really want to supply very much of the good, and they provide very, very little of it. While at the same time, if the price is very low, buyers would love to buy this good. The result here is we have an excess of demand. People really want to buy this good in large quantities, while at the same time the quantities offered for sale are relatively small. The result is frustration amongst buyers. Buyers would really like to buy the good, but not very much is being made available to them from sellers. The natural thing then for buyers to do is to start competing with each other by offering higher prices. After all, if I, off if I offer a higher price for a good, then the seller is much more likely to sell to me rather than somebody offering a lower price for the good. Now, we know in our system that's normally not the way we think of pricing happening. We think of price tags being put on things, say, by the grocery store that's selling us these very items. Uh, but we can still see a similar process at work, because excess demand really just means that we end up selling out of the good far faster than we expect. This suggests to us as sellers um, that we can get away with raising the price, because there is a huge demand for it. So the solution, either way, from buyers competing against each other by offering higher prices, or from sellers noting that they're selling out very quickly, either way, prices are going to tend to rise. 
So this gives us the result that prices that are below equilibrium to start are going to tend to increase over time. Once again, this proves it's not equilibrium. There's a natural tendency for these types of prices to change. Now let's look at case three. Here, the price is such that quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded. In this case, both buyers and sellers are satisfied. Every buyer that would like to buy the good at that price can find someone who will sell to them. Every seller that would like to sell at that price can find someone who is willing to buy. This is where we'd say the market clears. We can imagine, say, buyers and sellers coming to the marketplace, price is offered, and everybody ends up leaving the market. Either saying, well, this price was not acceptable to me as a seller, it was too low, it was not acceptable to me as a buyer, it was too high, so we clear the market for that reason. And the rest clear the market because they actually walk away having sold what they wanted to sell at a price they were willing to sell it at, or having bought what they wanted to buy at a price they were willing to buy it at. Either way, buyers and sellers clear the market. That being the case, there's no reason to raise or lower prices. As a buyer, I certainly don't want to just bid against others if I can get what I want at a lower price. The same goes with sellers. If I can already sell as much as I want, I have no reason to cut prices. So, in this case, prices will tend to be stable. But that stability is exactly what we call equilibrium. There's no natural tendency for prices or quantities to change. As a result, we would describe this as being equilibrium. No natural tendency to change. A couple important notes about equilibrium. The first is that equilibration is spontaneous. That is, it arises within the market process itself. It is the buyers and the sellers that make the decisions that drive us toward equilibrium. It doesn't require any kind of outside force stepping in saying, oh no, prices are too low, or oh no, prices are too high, you really need to lower or raise your prices. Instead, market participants realize this, as we have frustration amongst buyers or frustration amongst sellers, leading them to offer higher prices or to offer lower prices. Trying to alleviate this frustration will naturally move us um, toward an equilibrium. Well, now an important point here is that just because it's spontaneous doesn't mean it's instantaneous. It might take some time for us to get there. There is a certain amount of figuring out that has to go on. After all, um, very rarely do our market participants have supply and demand drawn there in front of them where they can say, oh, here's the equilibrium and go for it. No, there's, a, there's a discovery process that goes on, but it's a natural discovery process that will happen within the market itself without any outside force being necessary. Another point is that prices will serve as a rationing mechanism. That is, those sellers that place a relatively low value on the good, that is, they're very willing to sell it, are the ones that actually do sell it. They're much more likely to find the equilibrium price acceptable while those sellers that would place a very high value on the good aren't willing to sell it at the equilibrium price, so they end up keeping it. Those buyers that place a high value on the good are the ones that buy it. After all, if I place a high value on the thing, I'm very likely to find the price to be a good deal, and therefore I'm willing to buy it. At the same time, if I place a low value on the good, then I'm not going to be willing to buy it. Now, what we notice here is who ends up with the good at the end of the day? Well, it's those who value the most. It's either the seller that placed a high value on the good and therefore wasn't willing to sell it, or the buyer that placed a high value on the good and therefore was willing to buy it. Meanwhile, those that place a low value on the good end up not having it at the end of the day. Those sellers that put a low value on it, sell it. Those buyers that place a low value on it end up refusing to buy it. In either case, the good ends up with those sellers, potential sellers that don't actually sell, and those buyers that place a high value on it, and the good ends up leaving those sellers that place a low value on it, and not going to those buyers that place too low a value on it. And so this is a very, um, I would argue, a very good way in which to determine who gets what, is having this pricing mechanism. Find out what people are willing to give up to get the thing. If you're willing to give up a lot to get it, then odds are you place high value on it, you're the one that has a very high valued use for it. If you're not willing to give up much, then you really maybe shouldn't have the thing to start with. Right? So you end up selling it to someone else or you end up not buying it. And this is how uh, supply and demand interact through market participants in this equilibration process to result in the prices that you and I see every day. And it ends up these prices serve important purposes. For example, rationing goods to those that most require or most value the goods that are made available.